We're at 9 a.m. Uh, and ready to get started. Good morning. Welcome to the final day of Charcha 2020. We've heard from many speakers with diverse perspectives over the last two days. Um, so it's fitting then that we begin today's plenary by speaking with people who can bring a macroeconomic perspective that can help us tie it all together. Our first plenary session, Indian Economy, Recovery Through Inclusive Growth, is a panel discussion with leading economists. It's my pleasure to introduce the panel to you. Professor Kaushik Basu is Professor of Economics and the C. Marx Professor of International Studies at Cornell University. He's a former senior vice president and the chief economist of World Bank. He's also served as chief economic advisor to the government of India from 2009 to 2012. He's held multiple advisory posts for regulatory and multilateral organizations, including ILO, World Bank, and RBI. Professor Basu was awarded the Padma Bhushan in 2008. We have with us Dr. Krishnamurti Subramanyam, chief economic advisor to the government of India and a leading expert on economic policy, banking, and corporate governance. Dr. Subramaniam has authored the National Economic Surveys of 2019 and 2020, which has laid the groundwork for the union budget and other reform measures undertaken by the government. This year's focus on ethical wealth creation in the economic way has been lauded as a notable departure in thinking about policy. It also pioneered the concept of thalinomics, the economics of a meal. Dr. Subramaniam has also served on several expert committees, including the PGNI Committee for the RBI and the Uday Kota Corporate Governance Committee for SEBI. Welcome, Mr. Subramaniam, Dr. Subramaniam. My pleasure. We also have Justin Lin, who is the former Chief Economist and Senior Vice President, Development Economics at the Bank. Mr. Lin has guided the bank's intellectual leadership and has played a key role in shaping its economic research agenda. One of China's leading economists, He's also served as professor and founding director of the China Center for Economic Research at Peking University. The moderator for the session will be Luis Miranda. Luis is the chairman of the Center for Civil Society and CORO. He's involved in setting up two highly successful companies, HDFC Bank and IDFC Private Equity. He's also co-founder of the Indian School of Public Policy. Lewis is on the board or advisor to several corporates and nonprofits, including Manipal Signa, Health Insurance, Morgan Stanley, Educate Girls, and SBI Foundation. A very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you. Chris, over to you to set the context for today's session and take it forward. Thanks, Lakshmi. And uh, thank you also, Isha, for all the help putting this together and to the Nudge Foundation for hosting us today at Charcha 2020. It's interesting to see an economics plenary, uh, plenary uh, session at a development conference. And I hope it's sort of you know, indicative of what needs to be done in the future that as part of the development world, you've also got to look at the financial and economic situation. I'm sort of extremely uh, excited to have three esteemed economists with me, but a bit about the background for what we're talking about. As uh, at least all of you sitting in India would know that we've had the strictest lockdown as compared to other countries, uh, and uh, it is to curtail the spread of COVID-19. We received a lot of acclaim globally <laughs> for what we've achieved so far, but there is a challenge on the economic front, and, uh, and the count does go up, but much lower than what people have expected. Uh, the government uh, has announced various fiscal packages. Uh, it got criticized a lot for not being strong enough, but this week a 20 lakh crore uh, package has been announced, and details are being released every day about that. Uh, we've also seen the whole challenge with migrant laborers and uh, the fact that these invisible people have become very visible and the fact that they've been living on uh, in tough conditions and how do we provide them sustenance support uh, because they've been, you know, it's been a tough life and how do we, more importantly, reopen the economy uh, as, you know, without uh, controlling a second wave of, uh, of, of deaths. So the current crisis gives us an opportunity to relook at our strategy on economic growth and uh, you know, also discuss whether we need to make it a more inclusive society. So we have three great people with us today, Kaushik Basu in, in, in order of uh, their speaking, Kaushik Basu followed by Krishnamurti Subramaniam and Justin uh, Lin Yifu. 
uh, I will spend about four minutes now and then I'll pass it on to them and each of them will speak for 12 minutes on uh, certain topics. Uh, we've actually got an interesting insight on this because three of the four of us have been to the University of Chicago. But the only person on this panel who has talked about the invisible hand and the role of markets to help solve the problems has been Kaushik Basu, who did not study at the University of Chicago. Uh, but we've all got different perspectives, as you're going to see over here. Justin, uh, based on his experience of, the, of 30 years in China and at the World Bank, has argued a lot for an active role for the government in nurturing development. His new framework of development <clears throat> talks about the active role of the government in supporting selected industries to trigger structural transformation. And this form of industrial policy was criticized by Milton Friedman when he visited India in the 50s on the invitation of Nehru. Uh, and uh, in 1991, we actually saw a less role of the state and we saw unprecedented growth in India. So it'll be interesting for just to hear Justin when he talks about the China story, how you know China has been successful in identifying industries for a given country's endowment structure and level of development. Subu, the man in the hot seat today as chief economic advisor, has pushed forward the idea of wealth creation. And uh, this is an idea which for most of the last 70 years of our independence has been frowned upon. And it's a very important departure in policy thinking. Yesterday on the track organized by the Center for Civil Society, we talked, uh, we had many sessions on civil society and prosperity, because I think we need to sort of talk more about how do we make India a rich country? And, th and that's why, you know, we're having three people over here talking about this is a very interesting. Subu has also been instrumental in pushing through the nudge ideas of Richard Taylor, who I had the privilege of hosting at a fireside chat a few months back in Delhi at the Nehru Library. And his impacts, uh, the impact of some of his, uh, of Subu's uh, economic policy has been seen recently in the recent APMC reforms, et cetera. So without much ado, I'm gonna pass it on to Kaushik to start off. Uh, and by the way, Kaushik's uh, uh, become uh, a COVID refugee at the moment. Kaushik, over to you. Luis, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you, it's uh, lovely to see uh, friends from a long time ago. Justin uh, Subramaniam. Uh, in fact, I was just thinking that at the World Bank, Justin was my predecessor. And at the Ministry of Finance, Subbu is my successor. So this for me is sort of fitted between uh, successor and predecessor. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. These are such difficult times really uh, that we have to all stand together, pull in the best ideas possible. And we have to realize that no one quite knows what the right solutions are. So there will be, you have to recognize that and create that space and have the right intentions to take the agenda further forward. Since it was mentioned to me to make some comments on the IMF forecast about India, I will start with that and put it aside. You know, IMF in the last World Economic Outlook had the growth forecast for India of 1.9% for this year, um, which is, um, actually compared to many other countries in this dismal scenario, they are forecasting minus 5.9 for United States, minus 6.5 for um, uh, UK, 1.2 for China. So in the pecking order of things, not too bad. However, after that IMF has given clarifications that it's probably going to do us. And there can be no doubt that it will do us. All over the world, growth is tanking, growth will go into negative virtually all countries in the world. And it's unlikely that India will be an exception. India's lowest growth year was 1979-80 when India grew by minus 5.1%. So if we stay above that, then we haven't created a record, but this is a global situation and we have to deal with that. But for me, that's not the important thing because what happens with the GDP focus is when it's a usual recession, everyone is being affected, you focus on the GDP. But really in a pandemic induced recession of the kind that we are heading into, it hits across the society in very different ways. And so for me right now, the concern must be not with the GDP, but with the poorest segments, 
the migrants caught out in the streets, trying to get home. Just think of the situation. And people, workers who are, we now know that there's a massive amount of unemployment. People who are make, just managing a living. Our focus has to be on the poor, on the migrants, people who are trying to reach back home, reach some degree of safety. So all for, for that, you have to be aware of the invisible hand. I'll come to that of the private sector and everything. But the focus of attention has to be the poorest segment of the population. And one particular thing that has to be remembered is that COVID and death due to pandemic is very visible. Whereas usually suffering that comes from supply chains being broken down is a withering away. So those numbers get counted with a lag. And for that reason, we must not overlook the invisible suffering of people and be obsessed with the visible suffering. The first steps that India took, March 24th, 25th, India had to take. You have to get the population disciplined. You have to get to make sure that the COVID uh, spreads as little as possible. But subsequently, we are learning things. A lot of data is coming over the last two months. So there is a lot of learning, and you have to begin to use that. One general problem across emerging economies is we have been a bit too obsessed with mimicking what is being done in Western countries, in uh, Europe, in North America. And really, once you begin to look at the numbers carefully, it is very, very different, the situation across Africa, South Asia, even East Asia, including China. And I will make this point very soon. And also, to a lesser extent, Latin America. And the differences are so big that it will be a mistake if we mechanically follow um, European countries, North America, and try to outdo them in the kinds of policies they are following. Let me show you some numbers, the only one page I will show, which will, uh, can I have this um, Isha on the screen? Yeah, okay, they are a bit faint. I don't know how clearly you're seeing, but I will explain this to you in one moment. Most of the European COVID numbers come in the form of population uncorrected numbers. So many people infected, so many people dying. But you have to keep in mind that a continent like Africa, 1.3 billion, a country like India, a country like China, massive populations. And it is, becomes meaningless if you don't do a population correction. So here is a little bit of data, all from very regular sources, of COVID deaths per 1 million population. When you make this correction, you will see in Belgium for 1 million population is 756. And the best performing European country, well, Finland is probably even better, but Germany is among the reasonably big countries doing very well, 95. So that's the range. Switch over to the countries that I was talking about. Let's first take on India. Whereas, let me keep Spain as a comparison point. Spain is 584 per million. In India, COVID deaths is two per million. There are people saying that maybe in India we are undercounting deaths. Make it 10 times that. Don't increase 10%, make it 10 times that. Two will become 20. No comparison with 756. Even United States actually is much less than European countries, one third almost, because it's a large population. And we are not doing these corrections in our heads. The thing about India is, if you go across um, uh, Africa and Asia, the numbers are very similar. You think of China, because China took the first hit, all focus was on China. But once you make population corrections, India and China are actually pretty close. China's three. India's too, so China's 50% more, but India still has some distance to go and China also may get it again. We have Bangladesh is too, Ethiopia is less than all of us. And in fact, most African countries are too, South Africa is high at three. This has to be kept in mind. Now, many people will say, and this is at one level, if you are a leading global figure, you want to warn developing countries that look, you may be at the foothills of a big climb. So you have to keep the worst case scenario in mind but you can't allow that to cause yourself to be locked down for three months, four months altogether, because these risks are always there. And when the differences are so big, you have to take that into account and work with it. I can do without this page uh, here onwards. So you can just remove that, keep those numbers tucked away in your head. So what from here onwards, really 
a lot will depend on the exit strategy. Let me tell you, overall, I remain very optimistic for India. India's growth was slowing down even before the pandemic. It was being written about. So there were worries there. But the long run, I am optimistic about India for a variety of reasons. But I'll give you just one. I'll put it on the table and put it aside. I feel when the world re-emerges from this, the two sectors that will be the front runners is going to be the health sector. Globally, it's going to be a much larger sector. India has initial advantages on that. We can pick that up. I feel the outsourcing business after all the hyper-nationalism and all dies down, and I think it will die down quickly after the pandemic because of the pressures of global competition. Outsourcing information technology will be big. So there are big scopes, but we can mess things up. Let's keep that in mind that this is a very challenging time ahead for us. And I just want to focus on the steps ahead. What we were very worried about that India needs to spend more money, but the announcement that 10% of the GDP is the stimulus package, which was announced a few days ago by the prime minister, is a very welcome package. There are people who are sort of going through these numbers very carefully and saying that 10% is not really additional 10%, it will be 5%. But even if it is really 5%, actually that is a lot of money. We were at 1%, we've suddenly stepped it up. So I feel the money that is being put up for this is a good move, but that's the necessary move, the first move, but nowhere near enough. And that's where the task ahead is. We have to burrow in and see how this money is going to be spent and what do we do with it. And everything will depend on that. And I feel over the next one month, one and a half months, global investment capital businesses will pick countries where they will invest, sink in big businesses. China could revive once again. Vietnam is a very attractive destination. Thailand is an attractive destination. Mexico is beginning to pick up something. India has a treacherous one, two months ahead, and we have to deal with this carefully. If we do spend a big amount of money, 5%, 6% of GDP for a fiscal stimulus, our budget deficit is going to grow. The fiscal deficit, in, more importantly, the fiscal deficit will grow. We will breach our FRBM Act 2003 limits. To me, that is fine. This is a time when the, we will have to allow the deficit to increase. And the money that the prime minister has uh, allocated for this, I also want to emphasize that the big responsibility for this has to be in the fiscal department. So in other words, and we have to use monetary policy, but really as a complement and just a little bit because you don't want to infuse too much liquidity into the system. So in short, the main responsibility for the use of this is with people like Subhu here, Subhash Garg, Minister Sitaraman, and from the sidelines, really not the uh, principal responsibility, but from the sidelines, we can't overuse that, the Shakti Kanta Das and the Reserve Bank of India, that's going to be the package to take this ahead. There is one fear being expect, uh, uh, expressed repeatedly. The rating agencies will downgrade India if the deficit increases. To that, I have to say, I have dealt with, when I was in the government, I would deal with the rating agencies all the time. We cannot allow India to be held ransom uh, by, for, by rating agencies. And we have to take a little bit of risk. This has to be done in a very careful way, but we cannot be ransom to rating agencies. And let me point out that at times, what the rating agency attempts backfires in some ways. For me, the most memorable uh, time was when I was actually doing exactly the work that Subhu is doing. 5th of August, 2011, Standard & Poor's downgraded United States from AAA to AA, and United States being downgraded was global news. But what we saw after that for a couple of weeks with a little bit of lag, money was flowing back into United States. So I feel the fear of rating agencies, we must not overdo. I feel I'm very disappointed that they have downgraded South Africa, where I think Cyril Ramaphosa is doing an impressive job in Africa. To my mind, it's Ramaphosa and Abi Ahmed who are doing impressive jobs in um, Ethiopia and in respectively South Africa and Ethiopia. And Ethiopia, uh, South Africa has been downgraded, very unfortunate, but we'll have to live with that. The wind down, just a couple of words on how we need to do the wind down and that is the important thing. You know, in India, people got fixated on the one word lockdown, but the lockdown has many, many dimensions to it. 
And now we have to work through this and go for a curated lockdown. A couple of sectors we have to open up and we have to live with the fact that there'll be a little more risk of COVID, but we are way in the foothills of Europe and uh, North America. So we have to take that chance a little bit. Kinds of things that we should do is we will have to keep a restriction on large gatherings. There is no choice on that. We will probably have to, and this I say with a big dilemma, keep schools closed for another three weeks, one month, and say that we will take stock of things in middle of June and make announcements. It is very damaging for children. And we will have to soon devise rules by which you can open up, but maybe for another month more. So a couple of these rules will have to remain, but other things we will have to begin to open up. Factories will have to begin to function. We will have to enable workers to move. And for that, transportation has to be opened up. Workers to move, the managers to move. And we have seen regions and economies which have used lots of intricate mechanisms to get movement going. In Taiwan, I'm told that in trains, they are dropping screens in very small segments so that groups don't interact with one another. In domestic planes, if you make the rule that alternate seats have to be empty, I feel it'll still be viable for airlines because fair airfares will go up because they are using alternate seats, empty airfares will go up. At this point of time, it's better to allow for that and allow some movement of people than not do that at all. Local transportation workers need to come and go. We have to open up and testing, which is being talked about. Testing, not for the sake of testing, but testing to allow us to curate the opening up of the economy so that the market economy is functioning, which is what we need to do. And I'm ending up with what Lewis uh, talked about, rem reminding that I have been talking about this quite a bit. You know, the invisible hand of the market um, is uh, usually it is economists who talk about. And normally, I'm on the other side, reminding people that don't overdo the story of the invisible hand. The invisible hand has a big role, but the regulations and the state and the government also has a role. But I have been speaking from the other side, but I should tell Lewis, I have not changed my position at all, but the world has shifted over to the other side. So what I'm saying is sounding as though I have changed my position. It's just a reminder that the market is such a complex creature that if you try to control it altogether and say that the bureaucrats and the government, we will reach everything to whoever needs what and keep the market closed, we will not manage that. And there is a bit of a global fear that a whole lot of economies in Africa and Asia will become closed and controlled in trying to control the pandemic. We must not do that. We have to allow the invisible hand to function. And this is a professional job. And I'm really glad that Subbu is here with us. Justin, we will hear about China. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address. We can't hear Subu, you. Yeah, Subu, uh, sorry. Thanks a lot, Kaushik. And Subu, can you join in now? Yeah. Um, very good morning uh, to all the participants. Um, I, it's quite a job to uh, say anything after Dr. Basu has, uh, you know, made his remarks. But as he rightly said, um, you know, as a successor, I think I can actually build on, you know, even in this short. Uh, session, you know, what he's talked about. I think some of the points that he's made are excellent. Um, what I want to, I will actually use a, a different benchmark to try and, uh, you know, think about the same, same, same event. Uh, before I talk about it, one of the aspects that I do want to bring to the attention of all the participants is, an, is a bias that behavioral economics really highlights. Um, you know, if you uh, uh, read the book by Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, which is a book that I highly recommend for, for uh, all the participants, uh, he talks about what is called saliency bias, which is the fact that we overweight, you know, recent evidence and typically underweight evidence that is a little bit in the past. Um, so, for instance, one exemplification of that would be that when we are in normal times, uh, we do not factor in the possibility of a black swan event. We don't think that that is quite likely. In, you know, in contrast, once we are in a black swan event, 
then we tend to act back to normal times as well. And therefore, there can be a lot of pessimism, pessimism that can built it, get built in. And that's not you know, unexpected, especially in times like these, when fear is also uh, an important you know, emotion which is, is driving. And all of us analysts and economists are also humans, you know, finally. So the combination of fear plus the uh, you know, saliency bias can make us more pessimistic in our, in our uh, you know, predictions and in our judgments. I just want to you know, uh, warn you against that, you know, sort of being getting subjected to that bias. Uh, the reason I say that is let's take a look at uh, a, a pandemic that was almost you know, similar, uh, the Spanish flu episode of, uh, of 1918. Uh, because it's a pandemic, one of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'll come to this slide a little later, Mani, actually, if you can just take out the slide for a minute. Um, so uh, if you look at the, the, the Spanish flu episode, uh, one of the parameters that is used to, you know, to, to understand how bad the pandemic is, is this parameter called R0, which captures, you know, if the likelihood of, you know, the number of people who are likely to be infected by an infected person. Uh, if you take the Spanish flu, and this is numbers that have been estimated by Larry Brilliant, the epidemiologist researcher who actually also worked with the movie Contagion, which, by the way, um, you know, I highly recommend for those of you who have not seen it yet. Um, so he estimates the R0 parameter for the Spanish flu to be 2.2, 2.3, and that for COVID to be 2.4. And just to give you a contrast, you know, how close this parameter is for the Spanish flu vis-a-vis -vis COVID versus other pandemics. You know, the, the, the flu that influenza that comes every year has an R naught of about 1.2, 1.3, so much lower. In contrast, you know, um, pandemics like the like Ebola or smallpox have an R naught which is you know in excess of 3.5, so far worse in terms of the you know the rate of infection that can happen. So. Uh, from a pandemic perspective, the, the Spanish flu is a good proxy to, you, to, to use. Um, now, in this, you know, and if, if uh, the slide could be now brought in, uh, Lakshmi. So if you look at one of the key um, aspects, you know, uh, all of us have, rec I think, read about it, recognize that in the short run, there is this uh, trade-off between flattening the the pandemic, the uh, effect of the pandemic by basically, you know, uh, giving ourselves time and the economic impact. And I, I think, you know, across countries, we've actually seen that trade-off play out um, in the last couple of months. But do remember that a few months is, is the short run. Uh, this particular chart, I think, is important if we have to look at the long-run implications uh, of the measures that, that, you know, that, that, that are taken uh, to try and save lives. Uh, so what is being plotted here is on the x-axis, the mortality rate exactly the way you know, Dr. Kaushik Basu showed. Here it is being shown for 100,000 people. He showed it for, for, for a million. So on the x-axis, what you see is mortality rates in the Spanish flu for the various counties in the United States. Um, and what you see on the y-axis is the change in employment you know, using uh, from 1914 to 1919. There was, uh, remember, the, the Spanish flu episode was by far the uh, most devastating in, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in, in 1918. Uh, one more key parameter just to give you a, you know, uh, to compare Spanish flu with COVID. Uh, in the Spanish flu, one third of the entire global population was infected, one third. You know, in contrast, today, you know, globally, less than 1% of the population is infected. So about 30 times higher uh, in, terms of the, in terms of the infection. Second, if you look at the rate of mortality, the mortality rate in the Spanish flu episode was 10%, about 10%, while global average is about 3.4%. Um, and, and, you know, so, some countries are actually greater, others are lower. But so even if you look at the rate of mortality, one third, rate of infection about one by 30th or one by 33rd. So in terms of the pandemic, the COVID episode is far less devastating, at least at this point. And I actually say this, you know, I'm looking for wood to touch, touch wood, let it remain like that. Um, but, but it's at this point in time is still, you know, a far less devastating episode. And that is why it is important to keep in mind because even in the Spanish flu, 
if you look at the global economy and the US economy, there was a V-shaped recovery. What I mean by that is actually there was a decline in output, you know, in the year when the pandemic was bad. But after that, there was a significant, you know, pickup. For instance, the United States had a three and a half percent decline in the year 1918 and then had a seven and a half percent pickup, you know, growth, um, you know, in 1919. So this V-shaped pattern prevailed. Now, this is really important for us to, get to remember that, that we don't get subject to saliency bias and just put too much weight on what is happening now. Do incorporate the evidence from 100 years back of this V-shaped. Uh, and here in the V-shaped recovery, this slide is very important. And I come back to this slide. I just took uh, you know, some important comment that I had to make. So if you see this particular slide, you see red dots and green dots. Now, these red dots versus green dots are about the you know, the difference in the non-pharmaceutical intervention that was undertaken by different counties. What do we mean by non-pharmaceutical intervention? These are basically school closures, theater closures, you know, shop, shopping, uh, uh, you know, areas being closed, etc. The lockdown is basically a, a much more stringent or an extreme form of these non-pharmaceutical interventions. So now if there are two key takeaways from this particular slide, one, you notice that those, you know, uh, on average, those counties where the mortality rate was, was, uh, was, was lower were the ones where the increase in employment actually was, was greater. In other words, you know, the, uh, an expression that the prime minister used, Jan hai to Jahan hai, which is this evidence shows that if the mortality rate was lower, then in the long run, when you look at over a two year period or so, 1918, 1919, employment actually was created more. But more importantly, when you look at the green versus the red dots, what you see is that the red dots are, are more to the, to the right. In other words, they, these are counties where the mortality rate was higher. And these are also counties where the in, increase in employment was lower. When you contrast that with the green dots, it's very clear. These were the dots where the mortality rate was, uh, sorry, the red dots where mortality rates were, you know, were higher and the employment was, was lower. Green dots are ones where the mortality rate was lower and the increase in employment was greater. In other words, this trade-off that we worry about in the short run did not seem to manifest in the, long, in the medium to long run in a couple of years. And this is a very important point. This is an NBR, National Bureau of Economic Research paper that has actually just you know, recently come out a couple of months back. So it's important to keep this in mind. You know, um, and, and in that sense, I think I will build therefore on what Dr. And we can now take out this particular slide. We need to uh, you know, uh, go ahead and uh, you know, do graded lockdowns. So uh, the lockdown, the non-pharmaceutical interventions that I showed in this chart did not involve the kind of really, um, you know, a, a really stringent lockdown. So we could mimic that, um, you know, going forward. And and I think uh, lockdown four is going to be uh, is going to be very different in India compared to the other. Um, <coughs> let me just, um, you know, uh, add a few more things on what policy on the policy uh, dimension that we are working on. Um, the the the. Um, how am I doing in time on time, Lewis? You've got about uh, three minutes. Three minutes. Okay. Two and a half. Two and a half. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so one of the key aspects, and I think the you know um, migrant workers, for instance, was mentioned. For migrant workers, the one of the key problems they face is that they fall between the cracks. You know, especially in their access to food grains through the National Food Security Act. The 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 one ration, one nation, one ration card. I think together with you know, free meals for the next two months, I think will, will help substantially. But there's a bigger point that we have to work on, you know, when we think about migrant labor. Migrant labor is actually a part of the very large informal sector workforce that we have in India. 11% of the labor force is in the formal sector, 89% in the informal sector. And this is not an accident. Um, this has happened partly at least because of the very stringent labor regulations that we've created. We wrote about this in detail in the July uh, 2019 economic survey, where because of the kind of regulations, for instance, if you're a firm that is greater than 100 employees, then you have to do a lot more compliance. So entrepreneurs endogenously choose to then be at sizes less than you know, 100 employees. So these are the kind of, so in, you know, and they choose to be in the informal sector because the requirements of compliance and, and other aspects regulation are far greater in the, in, the, in, the, in the formal sector. 
So one of the key things, and this is what actually the, the government has been emphasizing, one of the key takeaways once the dust settles you know, on, these, on this package will be the significant reforms that will be carried out. You know, uh, this is in some sense the 1991 moment for India now. And, you know, you, you're, instead of looking at the crisis as a crisis, you know, we're looking at that as an opportunity. For instance, the labor reforms that are being undertaken in several states, one can, one can argue about actually the, whether the calibration needs to be a little bit more fine-tuned, etc. But it is actually very important, the APMC product market reforms. Louis, I'll be done in one minute. Um, uh, the product market reforms, which have been really, you know, um, sort of uh, long-standing for almost seven decades. The Essential Commodities Act, you know, which is something that acts as a deterrent to infrastructure creation on storage um, and, and other aspects. You will also hear about a bunch of other reforms on the, you know, um, so, you know, it, uh, as, as when, when the finance minister talked about. So, uh, the... One of the key things that will stand out you know, in the government's response to this particular crisis is to look at this as an opportunity to try and reset um, and especially work on enhancing productivity. And I'll end with the last comment actually uh, on you know, uh, the Chinese premier Deng Xiaoping you know, uh, would, would, uh, would, would uh, remark, and I'm sure Justin uh, would, would, if I'm wrong, correct me, uh, would remark that, you know, I don't care about the color of the cat as long as it catches mice. Um, now, when you think about actually the fiscal versus monetary versus liquidity measures, um, at this point in time, once we have to reach the various stakeholders, you know, provide them benefits, we will basically, you know, I think it's smart policy to utilize where space is greater. Uh, at this point in time, fiscal space has been a, has been a little lower, uh, but, you know, the, the the, the, the point that Dr. Basu made, I think, is well taken. Uh, you know, maybe this is the time to actually, you know, to not worry about it that much. Um, but as of now, we basically have exploited the space, you know, about eight and a half trillion rupees of, you know, money of banks sits with the Reserve Bank through the reverse repo operations. So that basically tells you about the liquidity that is there. So we have utilized that. Uh, we will continue to be, you know, uh, to, to recalibrate. This is a period of significant uncertainty, you know, what economists called unknown unknowns. And, you know, whether it's employment or some of the distress, you know, it's being felt globally. For instance, the United States has, you know, the number of unemployment insurance claims have actually been historically high, greater than that in the depression as well. So we will continue to recalibrate and come up with policy responses as required to ensure that the distress remains the lowest. Uh, I'll, I'll stop there uh, and uh, you know be happy to actually uh, say more, uh, take take questions uh, or, or give color during that time. Thanks, Subhu. And uh, Justin, over to you to talk about what what we can learn from the Chinese story. Okay, it's a great honor for me to participate in this session together with my good friends and uh, to discuss the lessons from China's experiences for achieving inclusive growth in India and other country. And according to the assignment, the first question to me is, how could China make such an uh, impressive achievement? Because in the past 40 years, the 70% of the poverty reduction in the world came from China. And uh, if we look back, in 1978, the per capita GDP in China was 156 US dollars. And at that time, India, 204 US dollars. So the per capita GDP in China was 30% lower than India's. But in the past 41 years, since 1978, China achieved average 9.3% growth continuously. And uh, last year, the per capita GDP in China was 10,100. And what make this kind of rapid growth to be sustained for such a long time? Certainly, as economists, we need to understand the mechanism of the economic growth. The mechanism of economic growth, on the one hand, certainly, is a stream of technological innovation. 
and a continuous industrial upgrading. And this mechanism certainly is the same for a developing country or for a developed country. But there's a difference between developing country and a developed country. The developed country, their technology, their industry are on the global frontier. If they want to have technological innovation or industrial upgrading, they would have to invent the new technology or new industry. And from the you know, historical experience that we see, for the advanced country, on the average, they can grow around 3% per year by this mechanism. And for a developing country, we have lower income. That means we have some kind of late commerce advantages on the process of technological innovation or industrial upgrading. We can learn from the advanced country to get new technology to upgrade industry. And this late commerce advantages enable a developing country to grow much faster, but how much? And uh, since the Second World War, there were certain economies. By relying on the late commerce advantages, they achieved seven percent or more growth rate and uh, continuously for 25 or more years. After 1978, the reform and the opening up started by Deng Xiaoping, China became one of those 13 economies. So my answer to the first question, how China can be so successful, it was because it is because China tapped into the potential of the late commerce advantages. Let me ask, late commerce advantage has been there before 1978, but how come China was so poor at the time? Well, it was because before 1978, China, like India, adopt, adopted a wrong strategy. The strategy tried to accelerate the growth of heavy industry or some kind of heavy industry oriented development strategies. Heavy industry was kept intensive. And at that time, it was on the global frontiers. And by that kind of strategies, it went against China's competitive advantages. On the one hand, because those kind of technology was on the global frontiers, you cannot benefit from the late commercial advantages. And on the other hand, it went against the country's competitive advantages. So those kind of development would have to be implemented with all kind of government support, distortion, and so on. And as a result, although the late commercial advantage was there, but China could not grow fast. And I think that from this analysis, it's a good news for India. As long as India can you know, develop your economy according to your competitive advantages to tap into the potential of black commercial advantages, I think India in the coming years can achieve similar performance as China did in the past you know, 40 years. But recently, there's a lot of hypothesis about coming collapse of the Chinese economy. In fact, in the past 40 years, those kind of prediction has been, been wrong many, many times, but each time, you know, it proved to be wrong. But this time it seemed to be very convincing because you know, in the past nine years, the growth rate in China dropped year by year. For example, in 2010, the growth rate was 10.6%. And last year, the growth rate was 6.1%. And 6.1% was the lowest ever growth rate since 1990s. And not only so, it was the first time for China to have a nine year continuously deceleration of the growth. And so many people say, well, you know, it was because of all kind of internal problem that China, you know, carried with it. And so the growth cannot be sustained and they can point to all kinds of structural problem. For example, China still have a large share of state-owned enterprises, very inefficient. China is in counter aging. China have high leverage and so on. And they thought 
that was the reason for China to have this kind of continual deceleration and Chinese economy is going to crash. Well, I have to acknowledge all those problems they mentioned that were there. But those kind of problems has been there for a long time. It was not the first time for China to encounter those kind of problems. And my position is that the deceleration since 2010, it was a many external causes. And how to prove that? We can look into the performance of other big country. Now, in the same level of development, and they exactly the same like China, started to have a deceleration of their growth since 2010. For example, India. In 2010, the growth rate was 10.3%. Last year, 4.2%. And we can also look into Russia. 2010, the growth rate was 4.5%. And last year, 1.3%. Brazil, 2010, its growth rate was 7.3% last year, 1.1%. And the other BRIC country, they did not have those kind of structural problems that China had, for example, state owned enterprises, or aging, and so on. But they have exactly the same pattern of the deceleration. The marks come from a similar external causes. And I think the main reason was the high income country has not, have not fully recovered from the 2008 crisis. And it had an impact on the international trade, on the external demand, and that was the main reason for the deceleration of this you know, BRIC country. And if that was the main reason for the deceleration, then where well, Chinese economy continued to decline and uh, come into crash. I think it all depends on whether China still have internal sources of growth. And for the internal sources of growth, I think if you look into the growth potential, you know, Japan, Korea, Singapore, they at a similar level of income. And uh, the gap with the US, the other one country, that's a measurement of their net commercial advantages. They all grow at about eight to 10 percent for about 20 years. So that means that the growth potential in China should be still about 8%, the growth potential. And uh, external demand certainly declined because of the sluggish in the high income country and China can rely on the internal source of growth. But if you look into the internal source of growth, one is potential, the other one is ability to tap into the potential. And uh, you know that China, the government fiscal position it's very strong. Its total accumulated debt was less than 60% of GDP. So China can use fiscal stimulus if necessary. And also the saving rate in China is as high as about 45% of GDP per year. So China can still count on you know, the stimulus to you know, leverage the private sector's investment and that will create job and uh, increase household income so the consumption will continue to grow. So I think that China can still, you know, maintain a reasonably high growth rate, around 6% or more or less. Then, you know, well, then certainly China still have a lot of structural problems, as I said. And especially China in the transition process adopted some kind of gradual piecemeal dual track approach. And uh, China did not adopt the Washington consensus, tried to remove all the distortion inherited from the heavy industry oriented development strategy regime. And uh, during the reform process, China continued to remove some of the distortion, but there's still some distortion remain because currently in the commodity, in the you know, goods market, you know, that has been liberalized fully. But in a factor market, still replaced. For example, financial sectors, we still have financial repression. We still have limitation of the labor mobility through the household registration system and so on. So I think in the coming year, China need to remove those kind of distortion in the factor markets in order to you know, complete the transition to a well-functioning markets. 
and this including financial sector reform, liberalize the interest rate control, and also you know, improve the financial structure, and, uh, and, 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 and also, you know, also the, the, the remove the household registration system, which limit labor mobility. And lastly, about COVID. China, the first one to be hit it, but China almost get out of the COVID. In the first quarter, the growth rate dropped 6.8%. And so the year's growth will depend on the second quarter, third quarter, and the fourth quarter. But overall, since China already, you know, move out of the COVID, you know, impact. And I think this year, you know, China is likely to grow at about three to four percent. So let me stop here and be happy to take out the question if you have. Thanks a lot, uh, Justin. So we've had uh, a great set of discussions and uh, unfortunately we've extended a bit of uh, our time. So we're going to restrict uh, the opportunity to ask questions, but the one which has received the maximum vote so far is this question from Daksha. How do we account for cost of production of natural resources so that we shift to economics of sustainability in renewable systems like Earth? Uh, all three of you are welcome to talk about this. Anyone want to go first? I can, I can respond sure. to it. Thank you. Um, I think that's a, that's a very good question. Um, in conceptually, what can, one can basically think about the, you know, incorporating the idea of the opportunity cost, um, but it will have to incorporate some, you know, aspects of climate change, um, you know, due to, due to, you know, economic activity in framing that, uh, the cost of natural resources. Um, I think, you know, if, if you, in India, you know, the, during the lockdown period, I, there, it's been a, we've seen a natural experiment that also, that shows that um, scaling down economic activity, at least a little bit, can have very beneficial effects on the, on, on, on you know, climate. Um, for instance, the Ganges, you know, which is a river that is venerated across India, you know, has just has become so clean just you know in the space of a couple of you know of a few weeks um, because the industrial effluents are not coming into it so uh, I, I think it's a very nice question which we should think about at incorporating it into our cost of capital calculations um, and i think by taking the idea of the opportunity cost and adding elements to it of climate change we can really you know uh, concretize that that idea Thank you. Can I throw in a remark on that, Louis? Sure, uh, of course. You know, um, uh, the cost, cost benefit analysis of the resource is one part of it. But actually, I'm just seconding what Subhu is showing, showing that by we picked up a couple of indicators in this dramatic moment, which is a bit of a reminder that by cutting down some conventional consumption and redirecting our nature of consumption, we can live much better lives when this dreadful time is over. And really the reminder is, you don't have to consume less. It's the content of your consumption. Instead of just more cars and more homes, we, if we consume a little bit more of trying to consume better health, even better reading, better development of the mind, all these things need resources. And it is a reminder to us that this is a dramatic moment. We have to come out of this with some lessons that let us change the nature of our consumption from the guzzling of durable goods that we tend to do to a more sustainable world. So in that spirit, I take the question to be a very uh, worthwhile one. Thank you. Justin, China's also seen huge changes and improvements in the environment. What do you have to say about this? Well, certainly, you know, China, need to do that because China is a continental, uh, like India, a continental country. And a lot of the externalities from the production or consumption will be internalized. And so under the kind of system, certainly we need to, you know, really look into the opportunity cost, not only now, but also in the future. And uh, so like now the environmental, and we need to go green and the government is promoting the green technology and the government is also 
you know, provide incentive for the firms and the family and the household to use green technology in their consumption and in their production. Okay. Uh, so uh, I got one more question from Sri Chan Sheshadri. We've got three minutes to respond, so each of you have a minute. A lot of commentary has been published about how the financial markets in India have been long due for a correction, especially given transmitting liquidity in, in the economy has been a concern with balance sheet problems in the banking system. Do the panelists share the same concern during and after COVID? I can take that. Thank you. Um, so uh, while I do concede that, you know, uh, the Indian economy is going into this COVID episode uh, with, you know, worse initial conditions on the financial sector compared to other, other, other economies. Uh, it is also pertinent to that, you know, if we look at the overall debt to GDP ratios um, for India vis-a-vis -vis some of the, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the, not some, all G20 economies, um, whether we split it into G20 OECD economies or G20 BRICS economies, India has by the lowest debt to GDP ratio at about 129%, um, with, um, I think, next country, if I remember right, is Mexico at about 188 odd percent. So every other country has the debt to GDP ratios are, you know, um, uh, either 200 percent or more. Uh, now, within that as well, if you look at, so India is by far the lowest in terms of the de overall debt to GDP ratio, which includes both general government debt and private sector debt. Um, but there's, a, there's an interesting configuration there, which is that our government to debt, you know, if, when we look at that, we are at the median of the G20 economies. What that implies then is our private sector debt is actually far lower which is also, by the way, a parenthetical remark that there is crowding out some crowding out, you know, of private sector. Um, but the, from the perspective of the financial sector, you know, if you think about a counterfactual, if we had far too much private sector debt um, and, you, you know, you had a financial sector which basically was not extending enough credit and, and you know, was, was for, let's say, in, in, in a lockdown, then the problem would have been far, far more exacerbated um, going into this episode. So I think that is in some sense a saving grace at this point in time that our private sector credit is actually lower, but it also tells us that we need to move far more into, you know, into in, in sort of inclusive, uh, you know, credit to, especially at the bottom of the pyramid and the MSMEs, et cetera. I would just say that I think the, some of the measures on MSMEs, you know, especially the change in the definition, I think can, can play an important role in that, uh, in that regard. Kaushik, uh, Can I to, add yeah. uh, one yeah. uh, a minute remark to this? Uh, the balance sheet problem, the reason I would be cautious and worried about this is I do believe that six months, one year from now, inflation is going to pick up all over the world. So much liquidity infusion is taking place across the world. It's a bit reminiscent of 2008. And today we live in a globalized world. So America infuses uh, liquidity. It sloshes all over the world. So we have to be very cautious on the banking sector, simply because there will be a problem on hand, which all countries will have to face about one year from now, which is inflation is going to pick up. But I think overall, we are strong enough. We should be able to manage. That has to be kept in mind. So, okay, thank you. I'm going to sort of now end, wrap up because we're going to get shut out otherwise. And three brief comments uh, from Kaushik. I've taken the point that we shouldn't worry too much about the rating agencies. From Subu, I gather that there's going to be a lot more changes in areas, including labor laws. And from Justin, India has the latecomer advantage, and we should grab that. Thanks a lot to all three of you for a very engaging hour. Uh, and I look forward to catching up again. Thank you. And thanks a lot to Nudge Foundation. Thanks to the Nudge Foundation. And I must say, I enjoyed it very much with the other four panelists. Thank you um, very much. It was wonderful. I really enjoyed the discussions. And I hope to see you in person in other occasions. Thank you. Yeah. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you, Lewis and our panelists. And um, this has been a great discussion. Thank you so much for sharing so many insights on how policymakers might approach uh, decision making in these really extraordinary times. Uh, we have